Well, we're talking about technology. And uh, it's true that sometimes even the government's technology doesn't work. Um, but unfortunately, most of the time, for those who care about surveillance, it does. Let me tell you about two things that have happened just this last week that is relevant to what we're talking about last week, surveillance and search and seizure. Uh, just on Monday, uh, the Supreme Court was the only government institution that actually stayed open on Monday during the only government institution in Washington, D.C. that stayed open on Monday during the storm uh, because they really wanted to hear this argument. What was the argument? It was about whether people who are under surveillance by the National Security Agency and other anti-terrorist organizations um, have standing, can challenge the statute under which the surveillance is being conducted. And the reason that's an interesting issue is usually in order to have standing, that is, have the ability to challenge a statute in court, you have to prove that you were injured by something the government did. But these plaintiffs can't do that for sure because they don't know if the surveillance has been conducted of them or not, right? It's the NSA. We don't know what they're doing. Okay, so these plaintiffs are saying, we think we've been surveilled by the NSA. Why? Because we were calling lots of people overseas, including people connected with alleged terrorist organizations. So we think probably the NSA was conducting surveillance of us. We can't prove it because it's all covert, but we think so. And the argument from the Supreme Court by the government is, well, if you can't prove you were under surveillance, then you don't have standing and you cannot challenge this statute. So it's sort of a catch-22 situation. We'll see what the Supreme Court says. I read the transcript of the, the oral arguments in front of the court on Monday, and even justices like Roberts uh, were concerned about this, about the possibility there's a catch-22 here. And Roberts, ten, Chief Justice Roberts, tends to be relatively conservative, tends to be fairly pro-government, but he, even he seemed to be concerned about this issue. So it'll be interesting to see what the court ends up saying about this, whether anyone can ever have standing to challenge what the National Security Agency is doing. And obviously that's directly relevant to surveillance, which is what we are talking about last week. Another case that's going to come up very soon that also has to do with what we talked about last week is whether the government can use a dog to sniff for drugs inside your house. Now remember we talked about this last week. But the case I told you about last week was a dog sniffing luggage in an airport. And the court said that wasn't a search. Why? Because a dog only detects evidence of contraband. It's a contraband-specific kind of device. Here we've got a dog, same kind of dog, sniffing a house as opposed to luggage. Should that make a difference? So let me tell you the facts. Police in Florida got a dog one of these uh, drug-sniffing dogs, and used it to sniff odors emanating from a house. In order to get the dog next to the house, they had to walk up the sidewalk with the dog, and at the front porch, they had the dog sniff the door, and then the dog also walked around the wall of the front of the house. Now, is that a search or not? You all know enough now to answer this one. What? No. Not a search. Why? Because contraband-specific device, dog just sniffing the odor of marijuana, and it's outside. They're not going inside the house. Right. Those are two good points by the prosecution, right? Uh, it's a contraband-specific device, and it's outside. However, someone just said trespass. Remember, in the Jones case, the GPS case, the one case where the court said surveillance in public is a search, that involved putting a GPS device on the bumper of a car. And in that kind of case, where there's a quote-unquote trespass, even Justice Scalia was willing to say there was a search. What would be the argument by the defense here? That dog is trespassing on private property. And so therefore, if I were the defense, I'd cite Jones and say, yeah, a dog is a contraband-specific device. Generally, when you use a dog, it's not a search, because all it's doing is sniffing marijuana. But if you need to, to effect a trespass, if you need to trespass on private property in order to get the dog to do its dirty work, this is the defense arguing, then uh, it's a search. That would be the argument. Now, would be th there be a counter-argument by the prosecution, even in light of Jones? It's a sidewalk. Very, you guys are great. Okay, it's a sidewalk. Now, granted, your sidewalk is your private property, but under trespass doctrine, a sidewalk is also seen as an invitation to trespass. Okay, why do you have a sidewalk between... Oh, you say no. Why do you have a sidewalk between the road and your front door? It's to have people come up to your front door. And so the argument would be, yes, it's a technical trespass, but the dog and the police were invitees if they stayed on the sidewalk and the porch. Now, what if they go along the front of the house? You see how technical this gets. 
but also interesting against. And we'll see what happens with the Supreme Court arguments. Um, uh, yes, question? Well, okay, the, the whole point is the police don't need a search warrant if this is not a search. That's, and the police did not have a search warrant in this case. Why didn't they have a search warrant? Because they didn't have probable cause. You can't get a warrant unless you have probable cause. They had a suspicion there were drugs in this house, but they didn't have probable cause. You remember, that's a 50% level of certainty. It's a pretty hard level of certainty to meet. So they couldn't get a warrant. So they used a dog to get the probable cause to get the warrant. But if the dog sniff is a search, then they violated the Fourth Amendment to begin with. You see how this works? Okay. <clears throat> well, okay, one of the arguments that people have made about the court's current approach to the Fourth Amendment is that poor people have less Fourth Amendment protection than rich people. Along the lines of the point just made, if you have an apartment or a house right up against a sidewalk, you don't have any curtilage, remember that word from last week, which on which the police could trespass in order to get a dog close enough to your house to smell odors. If you're right up on the sidewalk, you don't have that private property protection. And so some people criticize the court for, uh oh, I think I just went off. No, I'm on. Okay, some people criticize the court for focusing on whether a lay person standing on public property could or could not see or smell or hear what's going on. Instead, some people say it should just depend on what is being overheard or smelled. Uh, and if it's inside the house, some people say that should be a search regardless of whether the house is next to a sidewalk or 50 feet away from a public sidewalk. Yeah, Paul? Does a gated community affect it in some way? A uh, gated community could affect it in precisely the way I just mentioned in that it's arguably more likely the police will be committing some kind of trespass in order to get near a house in a gated community than in a house that's not in a gated community. That would be the kind of argument that you'd have to play with, especially now that Jones, that case, the GPS case decided last term, has made trespass so important. As I think I said last week, trespass had sort of fallen by the wayside uh, back in the 1960s when the court started focusing on privacy. But the Jones case, the GPS case, has made trespass important all over again. So now you can argue, if you're a defendant, both privacy and property uh, arguments, but the prosecution can do the same thing. And you go back and forth in the way I just demonstrated with the dog sniff case. That case, by the way, is called Jardines, J-A-R-D-I-N-E-S. So if you're interested, you can follow in the news, see what the court's doing with Jardines. The arguments, I think, are this week or next week. Uh, today. Thank you very much. Today. Yes. What if I just put a no trespassing sign up in my front yard? Okay. The, que and the question is, what if you put a no trespassing sign in your front yard? Does that mean that... It's clear the police will be trespassing if they go beyond that sign? No. In, in one of the, um, these are all good questions. In one of the Supreme Court cases, um, that's exactly what happened. The defendant in that case owned a farm. He had fences all the way around his farm. He had no trespassing signs on all of the fences. You, you've seen these kinds of uh, signs they, every 100 yards or whatever. He had a no trespassing sign inside the property on his curtilage. The police went over the fences, past the signs, and the court said, uh, it's open field. It's not directly on, the police did not go directly on the curtilage. They just stayed in the area around the curtilage. All private property, but they stayed off the curtilage. The court said, that's not a search. Okay? Even though it's clear you're trespassing, even though any of us could be charged with trespassing, the police are not violating the Fourth Amendment because it's not on the curtilage or inside the house. And the, the rationale for that is, anybody could have seen what was going on in those open fields. Maybe from beyond the fence, maybe using a helicopter flying 100 yards over the yard. So therefore, there's no expectation of privacy in that area. Okay, so remember Abdullah from last week? This is just to remind you of all things that, that happened to Abdullah. Only the GPS uh, tracking would be a search under the court's current doctrine. All the other things you see up there would not be searches under Fourth Amendment doctrine. Okay, I just want to remind you about that case. And someone asked at the end of the class last week, okay, so what happened to Abdullah? Well, I, I said he was innocent. I was sort of lying. Um, it, Abdullah's not a real case, right? I made it up. Um, it's, it's based on a lot of different kinds of cases. But I don't know of any case where all of this happened in one case. Okay? I said he was innocent just to bring home the fact that even innocent people can be subjected to this kind of surveillance. But, of course, I could also say Abdullah's a terrorist because it's my hypothetical. I can say anything I want. Um, would, would that change your analysis? If I say he's innocent, you say, ooh, that's horrible. If I say he's a terrorist, you say, oh, fine. 
I mean, that's often the way people do react, right? It all depends on what kind of person Abdullah is. The problem is, and this is the important point, police don't know what kind of person Abdullah is when they do all of this. They only find out about it after they've done all of this. In the meantime, maybe a whole bunch of innocent people have been subjected to surveillance. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. You can't base your analysis of this stuff on what you find out afterward. You have to base it on what you know ahead of time, at the time all of this happened, okay? So that was Abdullah's case. And just to remind you about one other thing we talked about, we talked about total information awareness. Okay, and this again was the icon uh, that was, I think, uh, fairly uh, impolitically used by Edmund Poindexter to represent what was going on. The all-seeing eye looking at the globe with the Latin phrase, knowledge is power. This also is not subjected to Fourth Amendment regulation. Why? Because of that third-party doctrine I talked about yesterday. What's the third-party doctrine? If you hand information over to a third party, you assume the risk the third party will give it to the government. And it can be any third party. The court has specifically said if you hand information over to a bank, you assume the risk. The bank will hand that information over to the government. If you hand information over to a phone company, that is your phone numbers that you dial or you receive phone, number, uh, phone calls from, the third party doctrine applies there as well. You assume the risk the phone company will hand those phone numbers over to the government. That's the third party doctrine. TIA, Total Information Awareness, based entirely on getting information from third parties, okay? From phone companies, from banks, from travel agents, from doctors, from veterinarians. Remember that one? You never know what an animal might be up to. And so all of that information can be obtained by the government without violating the Fourth Amendment, okay? Because of the third party doctrine. So what I did not get to say last week is, okay, so what would you do? Professor Slobogan, or what are some people suggesting should happen? Because obviously one approach is the courts. None of this is regulated. And a lot of people like that approach. And I talked about some of the reasons. If I'm not doing anything wrong, why should I care about this? It's covert. I might not even know they're conducting surveillance of me, so who cares? That would be one plausible, valid approach to all this. Another approach would be to require the government to have a warrant based on probable cause for all of this, for everything that happened in Dilla's case, for everything that TIA does. I actually have argued for a compromise kind of position, which takes into account what technology now enables the police to do. And I want to briefly go over that, and then we're going to get into interrogation. Then we'll start talking about the subject for today. Um, the first thing I do is change the definition of search. We've talked a lot about this word, right? The word search is incredibly important, because if something's not a search, you not only do not need a warrant or probable cause, you don't need any justification as an officer. You don't need any justification whatsoever. You can do a non-search any time you want to, okay? If it is a search, on the other hand, typically the police need probable cause, and in a non-emergency situation, need a warrant in addition to probable cause. They need to get a warrant from the magistrate. So what's the current definition of search? We've talked about it. Whether there's an expectation of privacy that's reasonable that the police infringe. And you know how the courts define reasonable expectations of privacy, pretty narrowly. You don't have much of an expectation of privacy, especially in public, especially if you give information to a third party. How would I define search? Well, what about this? Why not define search the way people define search? When you're looking for something. Duh. How about that one? Okay. Um, now, that's not the way the court's defined. And some very good reasons why the court hasn't defined it this way. I don't want to act like the court's an idiot. It's not. But this would be one way of defining the word search. And it has the benefit of being <laughs> the way most people would define search. Looking for something, examining something, looking through, uh, through an item. So that would be the definition of search. What's the downside of this? Remember what current law says. If something's a search, the police need probable cause, that 50% level of certainty. That's a pretty high level of certainty. That would make very difficult, but not impossible, a lot of the stuff that happened in Abdullah's case. For instance, the tracking. Okay, if the police need probable cause to track someone, they might not ever be able to track anybody. Okay, or if they could track someone, they'd have enough cause to arrest them, and why, need to, why do you need to track them? Because you have probable cause for an arrest. So that's the downside of defining search the way I'm defining it, at least if when something's a search, you need probable cause. However, we can change current law. You don't have to say if it's a search, you always need probable cause, because in fact, all the Fourth Amendment requires is reasonableness. The Fourth Amendment does not say, if it's a search, you need probable cause. If you remember the language of the Fourth Amendment, it says the government 
when it's conducting searches of houses, persons, papers, and effects, must do so in a reasonable manner. That's all the Fourth Amendment requires. So with that in mind, one way of defining search in a targeted kind of situation where they're going after a particular individual like Abdullah is to say the government acts reasonably whenever it has justification that's proportionate to the level of intrusion. It's a proportionality idea. Now, what do I mean by that? Some specific examples. If it's a house they're going into, they do need probable cause because that's the most private area that we have. Okay, your house is your private house. Your, it's sacrosanct. So when the government wants to go inside your house or look for something inside your house, it needs probable cause. On the other hand, if it's tracking you in public, arguably that's not as intrusive as going inside your house. It is intrusive. It is finding out some information about you, but it's not as intrusive as going inside your house. At least I would argue that. So you shouldn't have to have probable cause. You should only have to have reasonable suspicion. Remember that phrase from last week? Probable cause is 50%. Reasonable suspicion is below it. And if the tracking is not at all prolonged, it's just a couple of minutes, maybe you don't need anything. Maybe you don't need any kind of justification. That's the way the proportionality approach would work. It's just a suggestion. The court has played with this idea, but hasn't entirely adopted. But it's just one way of possibly reconciling law enforcement's need for information using technology with the idea that we shouldn't allow the government to get information anytime it wants to without any justification whatsoever. Yeah, question? Abdullah, and he looked nervous. The two, the two factors, and we all look nervous when the police stop us on the street, right? Yeah, but right, he looked nervous, and he had a Middle Eastern name. That's right. I would hope that that will not even be reasonable. Okay, it might not even give you reasonable suspicion. And so it's conceivable that nothing, even under my regime, under my proportionality approach, which does not always require a probable cause, it's conceivable that what happened with Abdullah would not be permitted. That's right, okay? There are a lot of cases, like the Jones case we've talked about now several times. The police tracked him for 28 days. Remember this from last week? They clearly did have reasonable suspicion. They probably didn't have probable cause, but they had reasonable suspicion to believe that he was up to no good. So tracking up to a certain point at least would have been allowed in the Jones case. But you're right, in the Bill's case, maybe not at all. If all they had was Middle Eastern descent and nervousness, it might not be enough. I will tell you that, uh, that for better or for worse, the Supreme Court has said that if you're the last one to get off an airplane and you look nervous, that's reasonable suspicion. We're not going to go into that, though. I don't want to start off on a whole other uh, sideline. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm a woman of color. I was at a red light. Mm -hmm. You turn green, took a left hand turn, the police pulled me over. I don't think you can see that it was a woman of color. Mm -hmm. She was violating the law. She just admitted it. You heard it. It's on tape, by the way. Yeah, I, that's, that's going to get us pretty far afield. I will say one thing, okay, that there is a phenomena called driving while black or driving while Latino. You may have heard of this phenomenon. Um, and what it's meant to imply is that sometimes police stop people just because they're black, just because they're Latino. Now, does that mean they're, they're trumping up a reason to stop somebody? Not necessarily. Every one of us violates at least one traffic law every three blocks. <laughs> I don't care how carefully you're driving. Okay, think about You probably don't know all the traffic laws the police can get you for. Obviously, they're speeding. There's failing to signal within a reasonable amount of time. If you don't start signaling uh, 35 or more feet before you turn, that's a violation. If you go over the median line, that's a violation. If you go over the, uh, too close to the curb, that's a violation. If you weave at all, that's a violation. Driving at an unsafe speed is also a violation, even if you're under the speed limit, if the police consider it to be an unsafe speed. Obviously, driving without a seatbelt on can be a violation. Driving with a cell phone on or looking like you're using a cell phone is a violation. There are lots of ways the police can stop you. So the police can stop anyone they want to, pretty much any time they want to. 
given the wide breadth of traffic laws. And the argument is they use that discretion much more with respect to blacks and Latinos than with respect to white people. I don't want to say any more about That's a very good topic, but it really would get us pretty far afield from what I want to talk about. Last question, I want to move on. In your new test, mm -hmm. you say police looking for something. Does the something have to be specified? Yeah, OK, good question. Does the something have to be evidence of crime, or can it be just uh, something that might titillate the police? OK, it ha would have to be evidence of crime. Okay? And that gets to the second point. There are two different kinds of searches. There's a targeted search of the kind involved in the Abdullah case, right? They're going after Abdullah, and that's where the proportionality principle would apply. But there's another kind of search. I think it's represented by TIA, Total Information Awareness. They're not targeting any particular person when they engage in all this data collection, all this data mining that's going on, right? They're collecting information about everybody. In the TIA's case, everybody in the entire country or the new fusion centers, everybody in the entire country. Their information is being collected. So it's, it's impossible to talk about probable cause or reasonable suspicion in those cases, right? Because you're, you're trying to get information about everybody. You don't have individualized suspicion with respect to any particular person. So one response to this would be, well, we can't do it then. If you don't have individualized suspicion, you can't do it. That's a perfectly valid response. It's, a lot of people argue that. Another response is the other end of the spectrum. Allow it because of the third party doctrine. An intermediate approach is what I have up here on this screen. We allow it, but only if the relevant legislature authorizes it. So in TIA's case, since it's a federal program, Congress has to authorize it knowing exactly what TIA is going to do. And most importantly, Congress has to realize that TIA will apply to them and their family as well as everyone else in the country. And if they're willing to authorize it under those circumstances, then perhaps we ought to let the democratic process uh, go forward. Huh? It'll never pass. Well, remember what happened to TIA. It was defunded within two years, with the entire Congress voting against it. Because Congress under looked at that icon and understood what was going on. So, but that would be the approach. And you can imagine some situations where the relevant legislature would authorize some kinds of general searches. So that's what I suggest in, in my book, um, this one. And I think it's one way of getting at this kind of stuff. But I want now to move on to the next topic. Um, we could talk about surveillance and search and seizure forever. Very interesting stuff. Um, but um, I want to get on to interrogation because this is the second most important method that the police use to get evidence of crime. Search and seizure is clearly the most important, but interrogation is also a very important method of getting information. You've all seen interrogations on TV, right? You've seen Law and Order. Um, you've seen The Closer, maybe. That's a show that's almost completely focused on interrogation process. Um, and you've um, seen it on various other TV shows. What you've seen is not entirely misleading, OK? TV can be very misleading as to what goes on. It's not entirely misleading, though. Sometimes police don't just ask questions. Did you do it? Here's the evidence we have against you. They do sometimes try to trick suspects. They lie to suspects. If, I don't know if any, how many have seen The Closer, just out of curiosity? OK, well, you know, she lied all the time. Right? She lied to suspects. All, she was very effective. She almost always got her man or woman. But she did it usually through deception. Okay? And then sometimes, and police do do that. They lie fairly routinely during interrogation. So that part of the closure is accurate. Sometimes police actually threaten individuals. If you don't, remember I talked about this the very first lecture we had. In death penalty cases, there have been some cases where the police have said to a person, you'll get the death penalty unless you confess. Now, that's pretty rare, but it does happen. Sometimes there's even physical threats. And sometimes there's torture. How many of you have seen 24, that uh, Fox show? Well, you, you remember Jack Bauer. He used torture all the time. Now, of course, his justification was the world's about to blow up, and we need to find out how and why, so we need to engage in torture. Um, that is fairly unrealistic. Um, despite what you've heard, we, the, America, the United States doesn't use torture all that often, but it has used it. In Abu Ghraib, among other places, it has used torture. So the question we're going to be talking about today is, when, if ever, are these questions that go beyond mere, these, these techniques that go beyond mere questioning? When, if ever, are those techniques OK? Is deception OK or not? More importantly, are threats OK? Is torture OK? When, if ever, are any of those techniques permissible? And what this gets us into are some very difficult issues. What is compulsion? When is a person coerced into talking? 
It's a very difficult philosophical issue. Philosophers have been dealing with it for centuries. We still don't have a good answer to that question. The courts are struggling with it on a more practical level. I'm going to tell you what the courts have been saying about that, but they're not doing a great job either of figuring out exactly when someone's compelled. Um, certainly you're compelled if a person holds a gun to your head and says, talk or I'll kill you. That's a pretty clear example of coercion, but that's not what the police do. They're much more subtle than that usually. Okay? <laughs> the, the, the threats are much more subtle. Uh, there's usually no obvious physical force being used. So, in those situations, is it coercion or not? And what about trickery? What about deception? Can that ever be coercive? And if trickery isn't coercive, is it nonetheless something we shouldn't allow, at least if it's a real bad lie, if it's a real egregious lie? Like, for example, what if uh, a law enforcement agent goes into a room pretending he's an attorney, a defense attorney? Now, arguably, there's no coercion in that situation, right? Basically, the defendant thinks he's talking to his lawyer. He's not being coerced into talking in any way, shape, or form. There's no compulsion there. It's a totally voluntary exchange. But it is trickery. It's clearly deception. Should we allow it or shouldn't we? So those are the kinds of things we're going to be talking about, okay, in terms of interrogation. And I'm going to tell you a little bit, a fair amount about court doctrine. I'm going to actually name a number of cases. You're not going to be tested on the name, so don't worry about that. But I do feel the need to tell you about a number of Supreme Court cases that help define this area of when interrogation, what kinds of interrogation techniques are okay and what kinds are not. So, so let's start with just some basic demythologizing. Despite what you see on TV, confessions aren't all that important in the run-of-the-mill case. About 80% of the time, police don't need a confession, don't want a confession, don't even conduct interrogation. Okay? They rely on searches and seizures, they rely on eyewitnesses, they rely on other kinds of evidence. On the other hand, confessions are important obviously in some cases, um, not only to get incriminating information from the suspect, but to do these other things you see listed here. Identify accomplices, clear other crimes. Sometimes they catch a guy, they get him to confess about one crime, it turns out he also confessed about 20 other crimes. Well, great, we can cross off all of those crimes because now we know who committed all those other crimes. And also to discover <laughs> threats. Interrogation can sometimes be a way of figuring out what's going to happen in the future, not what has happened in the past, which is typically what an interrogation is all about, but to find out what's going to happen in the future. And this is where, for instance, interrogation of quote-unquote terrorists comes into play, right? When we, when we interrogate a terrorist, we already have him. We're not too worried about him do, uh, what he's done in the past all that much. We want to know what he or she knows about the future. So interrogation can be a way of getting that kind of information. But again, to reiterate, most cases don't require confessions or interrogations. And when we do have an interrogation case, most of the time, the interrogation is very short and it's fairly polite, despite what you see on TV. Okay, the cops are saying, hi, uh, we've arrested you for robbery. We've got two eyewitnesses who said you did it. What do you say? And the guy might have first said, well, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Da, 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 da. But after 10 minutes, he caves because he knows the police have the goods on him. That's the typical interrogation. Because the typical interrogation doesn't take place until after arrest. What do you need for arrest? You need probable cause. You need at least, at least a 50% level of certainty the person's committed that crime. So the police have some evidence already. And the confession is just the closer, to use the name of the TV program. The confession closes the case. Um, usually the defendant realizes that and confesses. But there are a significant number of interrogations that do use problematic kinds of techniques. And that's what we're going to be focusing on. Okay. When is a problematic technique unconstitutional? When is it permissible? When isn't it? Well, we regulate interrogations primarily through this idea that you've all heard about, the right to remain silent. Right? You've all heard of that. That's the, Miranda, the first Miranda warning. You have a right to remain silent. Where does this come from? Why in the world would we tell a criminal suspect, the first thing we tell a criminal suspect is, you don't have to talk to us. Does that make any sense whatsoever? He's the single most important source of information about the crime, and the first thing we say to him is, don't talk. How does that make any sense whatsoever? Europeans don't think it makes any sense. When you go watch a European trial, I've done this, I've been to France and Germany, I watched their trials, the very first person who testifies is, guess who? The defendant. Does he have a right to say, I'm not talking to you, judges? No. He does not have a right to remain silent. Okay? Now, what happens if he refuses to talk? Obviously, you can refuse to talk. Do they torture you at that point? No, they don't torture you. But the judge will say, well, now, if you remain silent, we're going to use your silence against you. We're going to infer from your silence some bad stuff. 
they don't say it that way. They say it in French, for one thing, so it sounds a lot prettier. <laughs> but um, that's what they say. They say, we can use your silence against you. So you don't really have a right to silence in France or Germany. And they can't believe that the first thing we tell our suspects is you have a right to silence. Plus, at trial, you probably know this, but in case you don't, the defendant never has to take the stand in the United States. That's totally different from what happens in Europe. You have to take the stand if you're a defendant in Europe. You don't have to take the stand here, and most defendants don't for all sorts of reasons, good and bad. Yes? So given that the American legal system has its derivations probably from the European, mm -hmm. why are How did this happen? Yeah, exactly. Okay, well that segues right into my next point. Because um, the question was, since the American system presumably derives from Europe, after all, most of us, most of our ancestors came from Europe or somewhere near Europe, how come um, our legal system is so different? It's because we borrow most of our law from England, not from France and Germany. France and Germany have what's called the continental system of criminal justice. England does not. England has the common law system of criminal justice. And one major attribute of the common law system of criminal justice is common law system hates inquisi inquis inquisitorial practices. England never had the Inquisition. France, Germany, and Spain all did. Okay? England wanted to avoid the Inquisition at all costs. So, how did that lead to a right to remain silent? What happened under the Inquisition? Very, very simply and somewhat inaccurate. I'm going I'm to do this in a very um, short form. Basically what happened during the Inquisition was a person was brought in without knowing why he or she was brought in and questioned by inquisitors from the church. And the person was told they had to swear an oath that anything they said would be the truth. And if they didn't swear that oath, they were immediately branded a heretic, taken out, and burned at the stake. If they did swear the oath, then anything they said that in any way contradicted what anyone else had said, or that in any way sounded anti-religious, or in any other way offended the inquisitors, they were also taken out to the square and burned at the stake. It wasn't quite a catch-22, but it came very close to it. Okay? And the same thing happened in Europe with respect to treason trials. Moving away from the ecclesiastical, religious-based uh, in inquisition to what happened when kings started to accrete power, taking over the feudal system, when kings didn't like uh, what they hated most of all was treason. And what you saw were a lot of trials in which people were charged with treason. And if they remained silent, what would happen? They were traitors, and they were executed. If they didn't remain silent, they might escape liability. Sir Walter Riley did. But at the same time, they might say something that somehow would connect them with treason. For instance, they might say, I met with Mr. X one day, and the king can prove Mr. X is a traitor. If you know Mr. X, you too must be a traitor. So it wasn't, again, a quite a catch-22, but it was dangerous not to talk, it was dangerous to talk. And out of those religious persecutions and political persecutions came the right to remain silent. And you can sort of see how the right to remain silent in that situation. That you have a right to remain silent without being taken out to the square and burned at the stake, without being executed as a traitor. So it makes some sense that the right to remain silent developed in the 1700s, but slowly but surely it found its way into cases involving street criminals. In other words, not just people charges heretics, not just people charged with treason, but people tra charged with murder, rape, and robbery. Now, why did that happen? Because arguably that's a different subset of quote-unquote criminals. You could argue the first group aren't really criminals at all, right? Because they were exercising religious freedom, they were exercising political freedom. And in this country today, those wouldn't be crimes. Whereas rape, murder, and robbery was a crime then, it still is a crime today. So why should they have a right to remain silent? Well, the idea was, and developed from the first set of cases, that the state has to prove its case without help from the defendant. That when the state wants to put someone away in prison, it can't rely on the defendant as the source of information. Because if you start relying on the defendant, the suspect as a source of information, what happens? You go after the suspect, as long as it takes to get the right information, including innocent suspects, right? Because you don't always have the, the right person all the time, but if you're allowed to use the suspect as, if your mo as your most important source of information, what are you going to do as a cop? Why go out and search and seize? Why go out and find eyewitnesses? Why do anything other than just put the suspect in a room and question him until he confesses? 
And that's what happened, even in cases of murder, rape, and robbery, and sometimes innocent people ended up being convicted as a result. So that's why it got applied to street crimes. And I'm hoping that helps you understand why we have a right to remain silent, because at first blush, it doesn't always make sense to people why we do. Okay. So what did the Supreme Court do? And here I'm going to start getting into that case law I talked about. What did the Supreme Court do with the right to remain silent? Well, for a while, it just looked at whether it, uh, the court just looked at whether the interrogation seemed to be coercive. It dealt with a whole bunch of cases in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. So what are some of those cases? In the Brown case, very famous case um, out of Alabama, a lot of these cases are out of the South, once again, um, where the police strung up three black defendants by their thumbs and beat them until they confessed. The Supreme Court said, you know what? We don't like that. Uh, that's coercion. Um, now, the state argued the confessions were reliable. They were accurate. And the court said, we don't care if these confessions were accurate or not. Police can't do this kind of thing in the United States. That was a violation of the Constitution, the court said. So that was a pretty clear case of coercion, right? That's not a hard one. Even philosophers can get behind that one as coercive. But now we have some other cases. The Lynham case is where the cop said to a woman, suspect, we're going to take away your children unless you confess. Now, is that coercion? I see somebody saying, oh, okay. So maybe it is. Maybe most of you would say that's coercive. But it's not physical threat. It's not what they did in Brown. So we see a slight movement away from the obvious case of coercion. Then we get the Spano case. What happened here? A cop came in to do the interrogation. He happened to know the suspect. Happened to know the suspect. That happens, right? Sometimes cops know the people they arrest. And he said, you know what? I'm going to lose my job unless you confess. <laughs> is that coercion? Not to him, okay? So, uh, interesting little twist on the facts, okay? And then in the Lara case, a psychiatrist came in to the room, and his main goal was to get a confession. But what did he say to the suspect? I'm here to help you. I'm a psychiatrist. Some people are opening their mouths, but is that coercion? Okay, so that just get, and the court, by the way, said all these confessions should be inadmissible, inadmissible. Okay, all those cases were a violation of the Constitution. But you'll see the court sort of changed its tune in more modern times with respect to some of these techniques. The court got really tired of looking at case after case after case, looking at all the specific facts. It got very tiresome for the court to have to deal with all this. So what the court decided it wanted to do was come up with what it called a bright line rule that would tell the police what they can and cannot do during interrogation. And thus we get Miranda. Because what does Miranda say? It's not enough to do a case-by-case -case analysis to see if, in fact, there was coercion or not. The police have to give the famous warnings to the suspect. If the warnings are not given, the statement's inadmissible. We don't care what the police did. They could have been polite as people at a Sunday tea. It doesn't matter. If the warnings were not given, the confession's inadmissible. If the warnings are given, the person is told they have a right to remain silent, and they have a right to counsel, et cetera, et cetera, then we're still not sure the statements will be admissible. We have to make sure that there wasn't any coercion or cajolery. That's arguably a broader concept than coercion, right? Cajolery. It's what you do with your kids when you don't want to hurt them. You say, well, come on, let's do it. That's cajolery. And then there's also trickery that the Miranda court prohibited. So Miranda said, don't give warnings, statement doesn't get in. Do give warnings. Statement still doesn't get in unless the state can show no coercion, no cajolery, no trickery. That was Miranda. And Miranda didn't just give the, the warnings you see up there, didn't just require the warnings you see up there. Actually, I'm sorry, I should say this differently. Miranda only required the warnings that you see in that first bullet. But the Miranda court also said that suspects have the right to cut off questioning at any time by asserting their right to counsel or silence. So in other words, if the person does start talking after the warning, says, yeah, I'm, re I'm ready to talk to you, but then five minutes into it says, I want to stop, I want my lawyer, I want to stay silent, the police have to stop. Now, that's not a warning that's specifically given to people, but it is a right that Randy gives people. Okay, you don't, the police don't have to tell the person that, but it is a right. I'm telling you that in case you're ever interrogated, just so you know what your rights are, okay? Now you know, you can cut off, even if you start talking, you can cut off the questioning anytime you want to by asking for counsel or saying, I just don't want to talk. Okay, and so then as I said, the confession is not admissible if warnings are not given or if the statements are the product of compuls compulsion, cajolery, or trickery. So that's the Miranda holding. So how is it played out? A question. You have to be a suspect in order to... 
Yeah, there, I, the, the, Miranda's not triggered unless there's something called custodial interrogation. So, for instance, the police don't have to give the warnings if they just talk to someone on the street for a couple minutes. But if the person's arrested or something akin to an arrest, that is, you're not formally arrested, but you've got three cops with guns pointing at you, that would also be a situation where Miranda has to be given. Then you have to give Miranda warnings. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. So what has the Supreme Court said about uh, Miranda? The Supreme Court's been fairly hostile to Miranda, especially in the last 20 years. Um, it has interpreted Miranda in a very narrow way. Um, and that's one reason we haven't seen a huge drop in confessions. The prediction after Miranda was what? We're not going to get any confessions anymore. If the first thing you tell a suspect is, you have a right to remain silent, what is the suspect going to do? He's going to listen and remain silent. But in fact, interestingly enough, the research done pre and post Miranda showed virtually no drop in confessions. Virtually no drop in confessions. There was a slight drop in some of the studies, but certainly not a significant drop in confessions. So why? Well, two different reasons. I mean, there are a lot of reasons, probably. But, well, actually, I'll say three different reasons. One is the police were able to work around Miranda, and you're going to see how in just a second. They're able to work around it. Police are very good at that. All of us are good at that, right? We know of a rule, we figure out a way to work around it. And have you done taxes recently? <laughs> Case in point, okay? And I'm serious about that. You, work, you know what the tax law is, you're not going to violate the tax law, but there are often ways around the tax law. It's not illegal, you just work around it. That's what the police do with Miranda. Secondly, as I just got through saying, the Supreme Court itself has helped out police a lot by interpreting Miranda in a very pro-prosecution way. And thirdly, it is the case that sometimes people want to confess. Even though they're told they have a right to remain silent, they want to get it off their chest, or maybe they think they'll get a better deal if they talk. So those are some of the reasons the confession rate hasn't dropped significantly post-Miranda. The reason I want to focus on is the second reason the fact that the Supreme Court hasn't um, been particularly rigorous in interpreting Miranda. There are a lot of different ways the Supreme Court has been relatively pro-prosecution in defining what Miranda is all about. First of all, you don't have to give the, exact, the Miranda warnings exactly the way I had up on the screen. You don't have to say if you're a cop, you have a right to remain silent. Anything you say uh, can be used against you. You have a right to an attorney before and during interrogation, and if you can't afford one, one will, pay, one will be provided for you at state expense. Those are the four warnings, okay? What if instead the uh, police say, anything you say could be used for or against you? <laughs> That's perfectly okay, Supreme Court has said. Now, of course, what the police are trying to do there is suggesting, you know, it might be a good idea to talk. Granted, we could use it against you, but we could use it for you. Who knows? It might end up being helpful. No problem with that kind of warning. Um, there are a lot of other cases, and I'll just mention them briefly. Prysock was where the police told the individual, you have a right to a free attorney during trial, but if you want one during interrogation, you've got to pay for it. The Supreme Court said, that's fine. Close enough for government work. Um, <laughs> the Egan case, the police told the individual, you have a right to counsel. We have no way of providing one for you right now, but when you go to court, you'll get one. That was close enough for government work. The Powell case, the police said you have a right to counsel before interrogation, forgetting to mention there was also a right to counsel during interrogation. The court said that's good enough. Okay, so the warnings don't have to be perfect. Okay, that's, less, that's um, development number one. Development number two, sometimes the warnings don't have to be given at all, even if it is custodial interrogation. Okay, even if we have custodial interrogation, sometimes the warnings don't have to be given at all. For instance, when public safety would be threatened. Now this makes some sense in the following scenario. The police have just nabbed a terrorist, and they know this terrorist, or I think this terrorist knows about a nuclear bomb that's about to go off in the next hour. You know, it's, a, it's Jack Bauer, 24, right? Then maybe you could see why you don't have to tell the guy, you don't have to talk to us if you don't want to. Tell us where the bomb is, but you know, you don't have to answer that question. Okay, you could see how this public safety exception might be a plausible exception in that kind of scenario. But the facts in which this exception developed were a lot different. This is where a guy had been arrested late at night in a totally empty store. And the police noticed an empty holster and they said, where's the gun? Without getting Miranda warnings. And the guy said, the gun's over there. And the police found the gun as a result of the statement by the cop. 
And the court said that was a public safety situation as well. Why? Because someone could have come in the store the next morning, found the gun, and blown their head off. So you never know. Or an accomplice could have found the gun and used it. So yes, that is public safety, but it's a lot, it's very far distant from the ticking time bomb situation. And lower courts have used this public safety exception very generously to say that warnings don't have to be given in a large number of situations. Warnings also don't have to be given during booking. Uh, it's a fairly minor exception. So that's development number two. Development number three, even if the warnings are given, very often um, statements uh, made afterward are going to be admissible, even though the police engaged in what could be called trickery or cajolery. This gets to that trickery point I've alluded to a couple of times now. When did the police allow to use trickery? Well, there are a bunch of cases along these lines. In the Butler case, Butler said, I understand the warnings, but I'm not signing that waiver form because I don't want anything in writing. Now, what was Butler thinking? He was thinking, if it's not in writing, they can't use it against me. But the, and the federal agents who interrogated him knew, knew this, and they didn't bother alleviating this confusion. They just went along with it. They said, okay, we're not going to put anything in writing. Don't worry. Look, we're putting our pencils down. Nothing in writing. Now, tell us what happened. Of course, Butler, not being the sharpest knife in the drawer, told them what happened, and he later tried to get the statement excluded, because that's trickery. You know, they misled me. The Supreme Court said, no, that's not trickery, or at least it's not unconstitutional trickery. It is trickery, but it's not unconstitutional trickery. In Spring, they told Spring they were going to question about one offense, a relatively low-level offense. Then about 10 minutes of the interrogation, they started questioning about a murder. Totally surprised Spring, and he confessed. The court said there's no problem with that. Now, Spring's argument was, well, all of a sudden, the police switch horses at stream. They're going from one offense to another. Spring was surprised and maybe forgot that he had a right to remain silent at that point. He said, well, if I don't answer that question, I'm going to be in big trouble. The court said, doesn't matter. Even if it was trickery, even if it was a, a, a ruse by the police, no violation of the Constitution. Mathiasen, they lied about evidence. They told the suspect they had his fingerprints at the scene of the crime when, in fact, they didn't. The court said, no problem. In Frazier, they lied about a co-defendant confessing. And the other, you've all seen this on TV, right? Two defendants, they're separated in two different interrogation rooms. Sometimes the other co-defendant does confess. Why? He figures he'll get a deal if he confesses before his compatriot. But in this case, neither co-defendant had in fact confessed, but the police told one of the defendants that the other one had confessed, lied to him, and the court said no problem there. Okay? So what's going on here? There's a lot of deceit, a lot of trickery, a lot of lying by the police. The court said trickery is not coercion. In none of these cases was the person compelled to talk. It was just trickery. Okay? And take Butler, for instance. As far as he was concerned, he was just telling the police, he wasn't feeling compelled to talk. He was thinking, yes, it's true, as long as I don't put anything in writing, they can't use it against me. But he wasn't being forced to talk. He was having a nice little conversation with the police, off the record. No compulsion, therefore, no violation of the Constitution. Okay? Same thing, let's, let's say, Matthiasen. So what if they lied to him about fingerprints at the scene of the crime? He wasn't being forced to talk. He, could, he had been told about his right to remain silent. He could remain silent. But once they told him about the fingerprints, he decided to talk. That's his problem, not the government's. Okay? So that's what the court's been saying about Miranda. For better or for worse, these kinds of uh, police techniques are not a violation of the Constitution. So he has some great cases out of the lower courts. For instance, um, one form of deception that has been used in at least one case, and again, this is all with the predicate that many suspects are not the sharpest knives in the drawer. Um, thank goodness for that in terms of uh, criminal investigations. So they hooked the suspect up to a Xerox machine. Okay? But of course they told him it was a lie detection machine. And they had two pieces of paper in the machine. One piece of paper said yes, one piece of paper said no. Right? Okay? And so they asked him his name, and he gave the correct name, and they took out the people. Yes, so you're telling the truth. Right? He said, okay, did you commit the crime of armed robbery on April 2nd? He said, of course I didn't. And, and then when they, said, they asked the machine, because this was a talking lie detection machine, was that true or false? They brought the piece of paper, no. Okay, the guy figured, oh, they got me and confessed. Okay, there was also one case where the police convinced a person they had an eye print machine. You, you know about fingerprints. Well, this was an eye print machine. It can take the image off your eyeball, anything you've seen in the last 24 hours, <laughs> and 
figure out what you were doing. So they convinced the suspect they had this kind of machine, and he confessed. Now, is there any compulsion there? Or is it just garden variety trickery? Again, it's very creative trickery. But is he be, are any of these two, either of these two people being compelled to talk or just being tricked into talking? And the little court says it's trickery. It's not coercion. And all the Constitution bars we're finding out is coercion, not trickery, not deception. We're not talking Sunday school here. We're trying to get criminals. And criminals lie, so why can't we? The government, the police. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, well, as I said, you cannot do full-blown interrogation without the warnings unless it's, I mean, excuse me, you have to give the warnings if it's custodial interrogation. Usually these are custodial interrogation cases. And to have custody, you need probable cause. So as I said before, there's at least some evidence the guy's already done it, okay? But I want to return to that point in just a second. The last thing I want to say about what the Supreme Court's saying is that even if you assert your rights, remember? You can't, after you're told the warning, say, well, okay, I have a right to remain silent, I'm remaining silent. I have a right to counsel, I want my lawyer, right? And smart people do that. But not all people are smart, okay? Even if you do invoke your rights, it's conceivable, statements will be admissible. Why? First of all, you have to invoke your rights unequivocally. So, for instance, in the Burgess case, the guy said, I, understood my, I understand my warnings, but never said the magic words, I assert my right to silence. Instead, he just sat there for two hours not saying anything. What did the police do? They kept on talking, okay? The defendant did not say a word for a very long time, but the police kept on talking. Finally, one of the cops said, well, uh, what does God think about you having committed this offense? And then the guy started talking. It was the key that opened the door, and he confessed. And he later argued, well, I remained silent. I was asserting my right to silence. You can't use my statements against me. But the Supreme Court said, you never said I'm asserting my right to remain silent. You just remain silent. You didn't actually say it, therefore you didn't assert it. Same kind of thing in Davis. What did Davis say? He said, I think I want an attorney. That's not an assertion of the right to counsel. So, in case you're interrogated, remember that. Don't say, I think I need an attorney, or maybe I need an attorney, or an attorney might be a good idea. Say, I want my lawyer. I want my lawyer. Or else it's not an assertion of the right to counsel. Okay, even if you do unequivocally assert your right to counsel, they don't have to stop forever. If you in any way indicate you want to talk to them, they can start talking to you again. So for instance, in uh, the Mosley case, he said, I want to remain silent. They came back four hours later, we warned him, and he did confess, that was admissible. In the Bradshaw case, he said he wanted his counsel, and about five minutes later, he asked the cop, okay, what's going to happen to me now? And I, Presumably what he was doing was, okay, am I going to stay in jail? Am I going to get out of jail? But that was seen as reinitiation by the suspect, and they could start questioning him again. So all, I know I've talked about a lot of cases, um, but the, the general sense I'm trying to give you is, this court doesn't like Miranda, okay? And they're trying to nibble away at it any way they can. And in the course of doing so, they've helped define what coercion means for purposes of interrogation. And you can see it's a pretty narrow definition of coercion. A lot of different kinds of trickery and deception are not seen as coercive by the court. But this gets to your point. Okay, maybe for a lot of people, the bottom line question is, OK, does any of this actually make innocent people confess? Who cares about all this other stuff, whether it's coercive or not? The bottom line should be, are innocent people confessing as a result of this? Well, um, there's one interesting study just looking at murder cases. Just at murder cases, they found 120 cases where an individual confessed to a murder he or she did not commit, most of them being he's. So I'll just use the male pronoun, okay? 120 cases, just a murder. And, and, and think about how hard it is to prove this. How hard is it to prove that an innocent person confessed to something they didn't do? It's pretty hard because the person's already been convicted usually and the legal system is going to treat him like a criminal because it should. It convicted him. It sentenced him. There's going to be a lot of resistance, a lot of hostility to investigating these cases. How did most of this information come out? Journalists started digging into some of these cases. Sometimes the Innocence Project was able to show through DNA analysis that these people hadn't committed the crime. Various ways, but it's all very difficult. And the reason I'm making that point is 120 is probably the tip of the iceberg. We're just talking murder cases, and probably even in murder cases is the tip of the iceberg because it's so hard to prove these people are innocent given the resistance of the legal system to this kind of investigation. But how is that possible? How does a person who did not commit a murder 
end up saying, I committed it. I, mean, and I think most of, I know I think, how's that, I would never do that. So how could that ever happen? Well, there are lots of reasons. One is a lot of these cases involve people with mental retardation or kids. And these people are particularly susceptible, particularly vulnerable, particularly suggestible. So for instance, let me read you what happened in one case involving a person with an IQ of 65, charged with murder. Okay? And some of you have worked with people who have mental retardation. They are very suggestible. A typical trait of a person with mental retardation is they will do whatever a person in authority tells them to do. Why? Because they don't want to look mentally retarded. They know people think they're dumb. They don't want to look dumb. So they go along with whatever the quote unquote smart person suggests. So they don't look dumb. Well, unfortunately for them in these kinds of situations, the cop is the smart person. Right? The cop is the one suggesting them what may or may not happen. And so if they're really suggestible, they might go along with whatever the cop says. So listen to this transcript. Uh, the cop. Did she tell you to tie her hands behind her back? Answer. Uh, if she did, I did. Okay, already you can see some suggestibility. Well, if that's what, you know, if that's what she said, I guess I did. Uh, question. What would you use? Answer. The ropes? Question mark. Okay. Uh, question. No, not the ropes. What would you use? Que answer. Only my belt. Question. No, not your belt. Remember? Cutting the Venetian blind cords? Answer. Ah, uh, it's the same rope. Cop. Yeah. Okay. Now, tell a... Tell us how it went, David. Tell us how you did it. Answer. She told me to grab the knife and a stabber. That's a cop raising his voice. David, no, David. Answer. If it did happen, and I did it, and my fingerprints were on it, the police had lied to him about that. Um, then the cop slams his hand on the table and yells, you hung her. Answer. Okay, so I hung her. <laughs> okay, that's an example, a, a very extreme example of suggestibility. Okay, it was later shown this guy did not commit the crime. Okay, this was a, a cop for maybe unintentionally taking advantage of a uh, person's mental retardation. Maybe the cop didn't really realize this person was mentally retarded. My guess is he did, given the way this transcript went down. Um, but this is a problem. And the same thing happens with kids. Very suggestible, likely to give in to people in authority. If the person in authority is telling them they did it, well, maybe they're right. Maybe I did do it. Yeah, was there a question? Yeah, I mean... Right. Right. So the point is, the point made by Arlene is people with mental retardation want to be liked, they want to be accepted, and that's another factor that plays into um, this confession right by people with mental retardation. There's another problem. I just the case I just read you was the Persky case. Um, people with low IQs and kids, both children don't understand the Miranda warnings. Uh, one study showed that if you have an IQ of under seven, you have no clue what the right to remain silent means or what the right to counsel means. The word counsel is totally foreign to people with memory retardation and many children, especially children under 16. They just don't understand what those rights mean. And even people with IQs between 70 and 90, which is a huge proportion of our criminal population, doesn't really understand what the warnings are all about. And that might be another reason um, we have some false confessions. But there are also false confessions from people who are not mentally retarded and people who are not under 18 years of age. Why do those people falsely confess? It's a very interesting question. Um, one reason is a lot of people don't understand what the right to silence means. Yes, you are told, even if you're college educated, by the way, this is what one study found, even college educated people think that if you remain silent, your silence will be used against you. Why? Because all the Miranda warning says is you have a right to remain silent. Now, if you think about it, that should mean if you remain silent, they can't hurt you with your silence. But it doesn't say that, right? Did, you all, did all of you know that? That your silence cannot be used against you? You know you have a right to silence. You know you can stay silent. But what's the consequence of staying silent? What the Miranda warning arguably should say, given this kind of research, you have a right to silence. And if you decide to stay silent, you're, you're silent. Your silence may not be used against you. That would make it crystal clear what the right to silence means. But a lot of people don't understand that, including college-educated people don't understand that. So they start talking, and the talking sometimes gets them into trouble. But you might still say, oh, but they're not going to confess to something they didn't do. Well, what happens when you start talking? You start placing yourself at the scene of the crime. 
when the crime happened. You start mentioning people who were involved in the crime. I mean, the police presumably picked you up for a reason, right? They have some probable cause to believe you did it. But that doesn't mean you did do it. It might be you just happened to be at the scene of the crime at the time the crime was committed, or you happen to know people who committed the crime, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if you start putting yourself by your own words at the scene of the crime, or saying that you know a person who in fact did commit the crime, that can be inculpatory and can end up leading to a confession, not directly, not saying I did the crime, but indirectly. And then also there's some people, and this gets to the second point, there's some people who are not disabled and not under the age of 18 who nonetheless confess to crimes they didn't commit because what are called maximization and minimization techniques. Now, I've already talked about a lot of these techniques. These are techniques the court has said are, is, are okay. So, for instance, one technique is called the pretended friend technique. And it's like the Lara case. Remember, that was the one where the psychiatrist came into the interrogation room and said, I'm here to help you. Well, the Supreme Court back in the 50s struck that down. But there are a lot of lower court cases today which say that's perfectly okay. So remember I said the courts sort of changed their tune? Nowadays, if the police use this pretended friend technique, the courts say it's okay. Why? It's not coercive. It's just trickery. When the suspect confesses, what does he think he's doing? He's just have a, he's having a conversation with his best buddy, with his friend, the cop. There's one uh, transcript where a cop over and over again says, I'm your brother. I'm your friend. We can get through this together. If you just tell me what happened, we can get through this together. That was his motif throughout the entire interrogation. Okay? Clearly a lie. This cop wanted the confession, wanted to hurt him, not help him. But the lower court didn't care because it's not coercive. It's just trickery. It's just when the suspect talks, he just thinks he's talking to his best buddy. Okay? This is a minimization kind of technique, minimizing the situation. Another way of minimizing the situation, you're not really responsible for this, okay? You probably did it because you were angry or because maybe you were crazy or maybe you'd done some drugs or, or drank at the time. So you're not really responsible for this. Just tell us what happened and, and we'll, you know, we'll get the relevant help. Once again, that's not coercion. It's just deception, okay? So there's a very interesting study by, done by Rusano involving college students, so non-disabled people, people not under the age of 18, okay, well-educated people. What she did is she lied to these people, okay, ironically. Rusano lied to the people in her study. She, she told them her study was a study of group versus individual decision-making, okay, a study of whether people make better decisions in groups or as individuals. So she got a lot of college students to sign up for this study. Then she put each of these college students alone in a room with one other person, a confederate of Rusano, okay? And then they were to answer questions divided into two different types of questions. One type of question you answer individually by yourself. The other kind of question you're supposed to pair up uh, as a couple decide what the right answer is. And that was the way they were going to test this group versus individual decision-making process. However, the confederates of Rusano tried to get the college student to cheat. How? The confederate told the college student for a question that was supposed to be answered individually, let's answer this together, okay? Okay, the question was supposed to be answered, is one of the questions that was supposed to be answered individually, and the Confederate tried to get the college student to answer it as a couple. You understand what I'm saying? So some of the college students caved. They cheated. Other college students didn't. They refused. So what Rusano created was a group of guilty people, people who cheated, and a group of innocent people, people who did not cheat, right? You got me so far? Very clever study, she, she did, she, because it's very hard to do this kind of stuff in real life, right? Um, you lie to a person who's actually charged with the crime and see if they confess or not. You, that, there are also lots of ethical problems with that. So she's trying to do it in the laboratory. She created a group of guilty people and innocent people. And then what she did is she confronted both the innocent group and the guilty group with one of three different police techniques. Maximization technique, minimization technique of the type I was just describing, or no technique whatsoever. Just a simple question, did you cheat or not? Okay? And what she found was that 18% of the innocent college students, the college students who did not cheat, confessed when they were subjected to the maximization and minimization techniques. Totally innocent people, no confusion about whether they cheated or not, and they confessed anyway. Now, what's going on there? Well, you could say, hey, it's just a laboratory study. The college students are thinking to themselves, who cares? And that might be right because, interestingly enough, 6% of the innocent people confessed even when they were not subjected to any technique. 
were just asked the question, did you cheat? said, yeah, <laughs> when they didn't. So that is a problem with the study. But still, the confession rate is a lot higher for the innocent people who are subjected to the maximization and minimization techniques as opposed to the no technique condition. So I'm just offering that as an interesting study suggesting how these techniques might get an innocent person to confess. I will also point out that the confession rate for guilty people skyrocketed when they were subjected to te techniques. So that's also interesting. These techniques are effective. That's why police use them. Guilty people confess more often when they're subjected to maximization and minimization techniques. So it's a trade-off, right? We're going to get more guilty people to confess, but we also might get some more innocent people to confess. So what do we want to do? Um, the last point, and this is probably the most important one, why do innocent people confess? They're subjected to very long interrogations. Some of the TV shows show this. So the, the research shows if you're, if you're subjected to an interrogation longer than six hours, chances are you're going to confess. Even if they're giving you food and water during the interrogation. Why? You're just getting tired. They're not going to let me out of here is what you're thinking. I'm never getting out of here unless I tell them what they want, so I'll tell them what they want. Usually what happens after these interrogations are over, the person um, recants immediately. He says, I didn't mean that, but the confession's on the record now, and it's too late. Okay? So that's another reason non-disabled adult people sometimes confess. Yeah? So some of the exonerated people are people who confessed during prolonged interrogation, immediately recanted after the interrogation, but nonetheless were convicted. Why? The cops have a confession. The prosecutor has a confession. They already had probable cause to believe this is the person. It's sometimes what, what uh, social scientists call this is tunnel vision. And all of us have it, not just the cops, not just prosecutors. You get a theory of the case, and you don't budge from it. Contrary evidence does not budge you. Why? You're sure this is right. I mean, think about yourselves. That's probably happened to you, right? You get committed to a certain course of action, a certain theory of what's going on. Uh, you, you believe kid number one as opposed to kid number two did it. And so you're committed to that particular theory, and it's very hard to budge off the dime, especially once you get a confession, right? It's why the police go after this person. They think they've got the right guy. It's why the prosecutor continues to go after the person even after he recants. Because after all, lots of guilty people recant too. So what if there's a recantation? That doesn't mean he's innocent, right? So that's another reason innocent people might confess. It's because the police overdo it in terms of how they conduct the interrogation. And that, of course, gets us to this, which is what I'm going to end with. Okay? When, if ever, is torture allowed? You could say an interrogation that goes over six hours is torture at least for some people, right? But is it? And that, of course, raises the first question. The Geneva Conventions, to which we're signatory, the Torture Convention, to which we're signatory, both prohibit torture. The $64 million question is, what is torture? And even if we are committing torture, are there exceptions to the Geneva Conventions, which apply to enemy combatants, or the Torture Convention, which applies to everyone? Okay, so what is torture? Well, the U.S. Army Manual describes torture or degrading treatment uh, as, among other things, forcing a person to stand naked or engage in sex, beating or shocking, deprivation of necessary food and water. Now, is all of that torture, or is it just degrading treatment? Army Manual isn't entirely clear. This, by the way, is the U.S. Army Manual. It's the manual that supposedly applies to interrogation during wartime. And even if this isn't torture, it's not allowed. That's interesting. The U.S. Army does not allow any of this stuff during wartime. Okay? How about waterboarding? You all heard of waterboarding. You see a picture of it here. It's where they put a cloth over your mouth and they pour water over your face. And apparently, I've never tried it, but apparently what happens is you immediately feel like you're drowning. And it's a horrible, horrible feeling. I have talked to people who have undergone it, uh, people who are not suspects but wanted to see what it was like, and they said it's really, really horrible. And in their opinion, it is torture, but again, Torture is ultimately defined legally, not subjectively. So is this torture? Um, right now, the Obama administration is banning all of this stuff. Um, but, and this of course is relevant to the debate I was supposed to have today, but I'm not having. Um, the torture memo, written by John Yoo, uh, that came out during the Bush administration in 2002, said that none of this stuff is torture. Okay? Torture only occurs if there's severe pain and, it's not just severe pain alone, Severe pain 
and severe jeopardy, meaning the person's close to death, and a failure or dysfunction of bodily organs. In other words, your heart's about to fail, your liver's about to fail, something like that. So in other words, you have to be this close to death as a result of whatever the government's doing for it to be torture. Otherwise, it's not torture and the government can do it. That was the import of the torture memo. That's why it's so controversial, because obviously it defined torture very narrowly. Okay? So, sh should police ever be able to do this? Should the U.S. government, in trying to track down terrorists, ever be able to do this? Well, one question that raises is how effective is this? Because people like Dick Cheney would say, sometimes we have to go to the dark side. Right? Remember that quote from him? Sometimes, and he used that phrase, sometimes we have to go to the dark side in order to protect our country. Some of these people have information about a ticking time bomb or something like that that we have to get, and torture is the only way to get it. Okay, so a key question is, do we need torture in order to get this kind of information? And unfortunately, once again, as I said with surveillance, we don't know. Okay, we definitely have used torture. The American government has used torture in Abu Ghraib and Iraq. Uh, it's used torture in sites of rendition, which you probably know about, where we send people to foreign countries. We don't want to do torture in this country, so we send them somewhere else um, to be tortured. We've done it. Was it necessary? Did we need to torture people in order to get information? Yeah, question? Yes. Uh, how about the use of chemicals? That could be torture, even under the torture memo, if it causes that kind of stuff. And some chemicals could. But there's something called a nectine, for instance, which makes you believe like you're going to die, but in fact you're not. That would not be torture under the torture memo. Okay? It might be torture under the U.S. Army manual. So, yeah. Sir, talking about torture in two different right. Terrorist and police. Right. And I want, to, I want to make that distinction in a second. Okay? You're right, though. Uh, good question. Because you could say police should never be able to use this for domestic crime. But sh we should be able to use any connection with terrorists, okay? I want to talk about terrorists first, and then we'll come back to the police, okay? So is torture necessary even in connection with terrorists? I don't know. We don't really have any good information whether the torture we did engage in produced useful information. Um, I can tell you what some interrogators who work for the FBI have said. One of the most famous ones, Ali Soufan, pointed out that Abdul Jandal, you may remember he was Osama bin Laden's bodyguard, and a figure so intimidating that guards wore masks when they interacted with them. They didn't want this guy to know what they looked like because they were worried what would happen to them. Okay. He never did provide them useful information during torture, but he did end up providing them useful information um, after weeks of resistance because his interrogators finally treated him with enough respect to get him talking and then used sleight of hand to seal the deal, the kind of trickery that I was talking about earlier. Sufan also contends that al-Qaeda operative Ab, Ab, Abu Zubaydah gave up the identities of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, remember he was the mastermind of the 9-11 attacks, and of dirty bomber Jose Padilla, remember him? He was the guy who was going to blow up um, some, at least allegedly blow up some buildings in the Northeast. They got confessions from them not through torture, but through guile and graft. And several other military interrogators who have been interrogated about how they interrogate um, say they can get intelligence through the subtle arts of interrogation as opposed to through physical pressure of the type involved in torture. I have a friend who does this kind of stuff. He never uses torture. He gets to be good buddies with the people he's interrogating. I'm talking about a person who interrogates terrorists or alleged terrorists or suspected terrorists. Um, he swears you don't need torture in order to get good information because as soon as you start using torture, it makes them hostile to you. It leads to them distrusting you and they're a lost cause. Any information you get is likely to be bad information. They're trying to hurt you, not help you. That's his argument. Now, I'm not sure that's right. I'm only giving you what we know from public statements by interrogators. So that's question number one. Question number two, if we do allow torture, is it going to be confined? And this is where I'm starting to get to the police. Is it going to be confined to anti-terrorist situations? Or are we going to have the kind of mission creep we saw with surveillance? Remember last week? I talked about TIA getting spread to illegal immigrant investigations and deadbeat dad investigations and camera surveillance spreading from crime uh, investigation to getting homeless people off the streets. Well, it could happen here too, right? Remember last week I mentioned that over 15,000 people of Middle Eastern descent were picked up after 
to be interviewed? How do we know they weren't terrorists? Why can't we torture them? If we can torture people who might have information about terrorists, let's torture all those people too, those 15,000 people. Now you could say, well, but they were just picked up. We don't know if they're terrorists. Well, how do you know? I mean, they were picked up, presumably, because it was after 9-11, and they might have information about terrorism. So if we, can use ter if we can use torture to get information to prevent terrorist acts, why can't the FBI use torture against any one of those 15,000 people in their discretion? That's the possible concern of mission creep. I'm not saying the FBI did. I don't think the FBI did, by the way. I'm just saying that's a concern. If you authorize torture, it might start spreading beyond what we think of as a classic example of Abu Zabadeya being interrogated using torture to some other people who are not so clearly masterminds of terrorist activity. Yeah? Well, you would suspect that under torture, the accuracy of the information that you derive is highly suspect. Well, that's what my friend says. Yeah, he, any data on that? Uh, well, no, the question was, is there any data about how inaccurate information is when you use torture. There is the one person, um, Abu, he gave lots of misinformation when he was being tortured. Um, my guess is he would have given lots of information even when he wasn't being tortured, okay? He was trying to muck around with us. But eventually, through this pretended friend technique, they ended up getting good information from him. This, again, is the assertion of the interrogators. Um, I can't vouch for anything I just told you about in this, uh, efficacy because it's all sort of hush-hush, but these are the interrogators who come out in public. Last thing I want to say, and then we'll stop, is Israel has a very interesting approach to this. It absolutely bans torture, defined pretty broadly. And so it's a crime if a government official uses torture, and the government official will be prosecuted, and Israel uh, agents have been prosecuted for torture. However, there is a necessity defense that these agents can advance. What is a necessity defense? I absolutely had to use torture. There was no other way I could get information that would end up uh, preventing hundreds or thousands of people being killed. Okay? It's a well-recognized criminal law defense that even if you commit a crime, you have a defense to that crime if you prevented a greater harm, if it was necessary for you to commit that crime to prevent a greater harm. So what Israel does is say, it is a crime, you will be prosecuted, but if you can come up with a convincing argument with that torture was the only way a greater harm would be prevented, then we'll excuse you. So that's an interesting way of dealing with the torture issue, which I think is worth thinking about. I've got to stop. We're over time, okay? Um, so thanks very much, and I'll see you next week. If you've got questions, I'd be glad to talk about it. Yeah.